Today's episode of Because Science is sponsored by Mac Weldon. Oh, hello. I just took off my helmet even though I'm about to encounter the first extraterrestrial life forms because I'm a bad scientist. But I, I, I can't help it. These xenomorph things are too interesting, too complicated, too unnecessarily convoluted. I have to study them up close and personal. What is their life cycle? What the heck is the black goo? How do xenomorphs really work? For the last 40 years since the original Alien came out, fans have speculated about how the iconic monsters work. There has to be some science in the science fiction, right? But fans have always argued because the Alien franchise is intentionally vague about biology and life cycles. The movies want you to be in the dark to heighten the horror. However, the movies sometimes feel downright contradictory. So how do the xenomorphs work? I, I think I figured it out, yes, even with Prometheus. In the first Alien, and even Aliens, the life cycle of the Xenomorph isn't all that complicated if you know where the filmmakers were coming from. According to screenwriter Dan O'Bannon in an essay entitled Something Perfectly Disgusting, <clears throat> I patterned the Alien's life cycle on real parasites. Parasitic wasps treat caterpillars in an altogether revolting manner, the study of which I commend to anyone who is tired of having good dreams. You're tired of having good dreams, right? This is Cortesia glomerata, a parasitic wasp that parasitizes caterpillars. It does so by laying eggs inside of the caterpillar's body, which eat them from the inside out and eventually bug burst from their bodies, wherever their chest may be, after a gestation period. Look familiar? Whoa! Nice try, loser. <laughs> Both co-writer Ronald Shusett and director Ridley Scott have been quoted as saying that parasitic wasps inspired the life cycle of the original alien. You're tired of having good dreams, right? This is Rissa persuasoria, which Ridley Scott mentioned in an interview. It crawls along wood, finds a grub underneath that wood, drills into the wood with its butt, and then inserts eggs into the grub, which then hatch into larvae, which eat the grub from the inside out, muscles first, vital organs last. This is the tarantula hawk wasp, which Shuset has mentioned in interviews. It paralyzes a spider, leads it to a den, and then lays an egg on its abdomen, which then hatches into a larvae and burrows into the spider, eating it from the inside out, muscles first, vital organs last, and then eventually emerges as an adult animal. Sounds just like an alien incapacitating a human for a face hugger, doesn't it? With this inspiration, O'Bannon said that, wait, where's, where's the, no. O'Bannon said that these alien beings had two sexes on their own, but they needed a third animal to reproduce. So they bring in an animal, put it up next to a face hugger or spore, and then wham, they'd lead the inseminated animal off to enclosure somewhere to await the birth. This is more or less exactly what parasitic wasps do. They fertilize each other first, but need a third animal to complete the life cycle. So, this is the classic xenomorph life cycle. Humans stumble upon a long dead race of parasites that died out before they could get their last fertilized eggs, hosts. But then humans arrive and the eggs activate and then a embryo delivery device, or face, face hugger, attaches to a human and implants an embryo inside that human. And after a gestation period, the embryo bursts forth from the chest, eventually growing into a full grown xenomorph. Xenomorph has to find another mate to continue this process, but this is the gist of it. Parasitic wasps don't have queens, but James Cameron's addition of one doesn't really change anything. It just, uh, it just adds a step. The, the black goo though, that makes things complicated. The film Prometheus introduces a number of distinct looking creatures, but they are all linked by the goo. We see goosposure lead to everything from the hammerpedes, to the trilobite, to the deacon alien, and finally to a zombie guy? How the heck does the original xenomorph life cycle fit into any of this? 
According to the movie, Zagu is actually chemical A0-3959X.91-15, or a so-called genetic accelerant. Now, it's my theory and many others that this genetic accelerant takes whatever biology it finds and weaponizes it. It takes any living thing and through a genetic process makes it more xenomorphy, depending on the genetics it's working with. I mean, really, you, the first alien you see and it looks like a vagina snake and the, you wanna take off your helmet and touch it, that's just... No, dude, that's just your fault. You're bad at your job. So Zaku takes Holloway's sperm and transforms it into the trilobite, which in turn infects the engineer, which becomes the Deacon alien. Zagu also infects some native worms on LV223 and makes them a lot more hostile and acidy, the hammerpeeds. But what about that zombie guy? Well, in a deleted scene for Prometheus, he was initially supposed to be a lot more like a xenomorph human hybrid or transforming into a xenomorph himself. This only goes to show that this is what Zagu does. It takes living things and gives them xenomorph-like qualities. But how does the black goo take biology and weaponize it? And how does that fit into the xenomorph life cycle as we know it and the original Alien franchise? I've been calling the alien aliens xenomorphs this whole time, which implies that they are a singular species. So how can there be so many different animals in all these movies? That's because xenomorph is not a species name. It's a description. Xenomorph means strange form. The classic xenomorph that we're used to then is simply just the strange forms that Zagu gives to humans, just like the hammerpede is the strange form given to the worms on LV223. If all this is the case, then Zagu, filled with microorganisms or viruses or nanomachines or whatever, could be a vector for intense and specific horizontal gene transfer, which is the transfer of genetic material between organisms and not between generations like the gene transfer that created you. This genetic accelerant then more or less attacks host cells and inserts genetic material into them. Those cells take up the new material and express those genes and change the entire organism as a result. We see this most frequently happening in bacteria, which can share genetic material to become antibiotic resistant, for example. But in this case, Zagu could share xenomorph-like genes with any organism to make them more alien. But where does the dog alien from Alien Cubed fit in? It doesn't. That movie's bad. <laughs> so where does all of this leave the alien life cycle, including Zagu? <sighs> all right, so from the original movie, we know that a xenomorph needs to interact with another xenomorph to fertilize an egg and further on the strange forms. So first, Zagu has to interact with a human, and then the human transforms into a xenomorph, and with another xenomorph, that fertilizes an egg, with the embryo transfer device, the face, the face hugger inside, which interacts with a human, which then becomes a xenomorph after the chest bursting, which one of them could split off and become the queen. The goo also attempts to do the same thing with human sperm, forming the trilobite, which interacts with the engineer, which interacts to form the deacon after some bursting as well. And Zaku also interacts with the worms on LV223 and then becomes uh, the, the hammerpeed. And all of this can happen via horizontal gene transfer. And that all makes sense, except only the strange form of the human and Zaku will produce the classic xenomorph that you're familiar with. So, what is the true xenomorph life cycle? Well, it all started with humans that were exposed to a bioweapon that became a strange form of a parasite that needed a third party to reproduce, just like a parasitic wasp, and all of that was via a process known as horizontal gene transfer. <sighs> well, of, of course, everything would have been a lot more straightforward and sensical if Ridley Scott had stuck to his original vision, but hey, life, even fictional life, it's complicated. Because. Huh, huh, because. Huh, oh! <laughs> 
Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at SciFile, where you can suggest ideas for future episodes, and on Instagram under the same handle, where you can now see many episodes of the show, just like you can on Facebook, which I forgot to mention. So go do it and ask me questions. Don't at me. You can at me. And a special thanks to this week's sponsor, Mac Weldon, makers of premium underwear, workout wear, hoodies, outerwear. Uh, they are super high quality, which I appreciate because I have extreme skin sensitivities. I can tell if all of my hairs on my body are in the same direction or not. So when it comes to buying stuff that fits well and feels good on your skin, I take it super, super seriously. And I just ordered some stuff from Mack Weldon and it was super easy. And now if you have the same uh, needs for your clothing, you can order from them and get 20% off your purchase, which is more than most promo codes, I think, using the promo code SCIENCE. Hey, you're a human with skin, be comfortable in it. And if you don't like the clothing, they'll, they'll refund you, no questions asked, and you can keep the garment. Promo code SCIENCE, Mack Weldon. Have you ever seen the tagline for Alien 3, which is actually Alien Cubed, right? They, they write it like this, write it like this, like that. And the tagline, they say, three times the horror, three times the scares and, and stuff. They say three times, but this is cubed. So the, <laughs> the only way for that to be true is if the original alien had only 1.733 uh, horror. Like that was the value of horror. And then if you cube this, then it's gonna be three times the original value.